with prayer and I'll let whoever comes in after come in and let's open up. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord. Uh, during this Easter week, this uh, uh, holy week last week leading up to this wonderful seven weeks of one big day of resurrection celebration, Easter day in your church. Help us to uh, live in that joy, that Easter resurrection, uh, never having to fear, uh, but always knowing that you are here with us. Bless us, Lord, as we continue uh, our study through uh, chapter nine of Daniel, and uh, that we would uh, grow in our faith uh, and uh, walk with Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, if I remembered correctly, we didn't finish uh, chapter nine. And I think we stopped at ver um, chapter nine is Daniel's prayer for his people uh, with repentance and um, things along that line. And then Gabriel comes and answers a prayer. And before I forget, let me just call this up because I did remember to do this, to look up some of these other archangels. So let me... Uh, Okay, let me move there. And I picked this off of a website because I couldn't find it in my library. I didn't, for whatever reason, I couldn't find it. Let me share screen. Okay, here we go. So this is Gabriel, the, uh, the archangel, who is um, talking to Daniel. And in in the Canaan, the Canaan, the canonical scriptures, we have Gabriel and we got Michael, okay? And um, there are a number of different ones that are on, that that are available, and you find them in extra biblical literature or things along that line. Let me find out where they are. So there's seven of them, and where are their names? And each one sort of has their own duty. Um, my eyes are getting blurry. So you just passed it, Pastor. It's up he, there at the top, first paragraph, showed the five names. There should be seven of them. We're right in here. No. Further up. Can now. you uh, control find and just type one of their names in? Well, yeah, I know. Whoa, whoa, slow down. Yeah. Now scroll up. I just seen it was on one sentence on the yeah. bottom of a paragraph. Okay. It's Control like, F. Th there was a list of them. I just had a, there, let me just see. Yeah, you just keep going too fast. Now. So there's Michael, there's Gabriel. And those are the guys we know. There's Raphael. Um, he's not mentioned in, in scripture, but he's one of them. And his duty, let's see, was a uh, healer. So he was in charge of the healing. Michael was in charge of, I think, the military. Gabriel is in charge of uh, m m messaging. So, um, you know, Gabriel shows up uh, at the Annunciation to Mary and Joseph, um, things along that line. Here's the other archangels. The other <clears throat> four, you got uh, Uriel, um, whose name means fire of God. He was the archangel of repentance and of the damned. He was a specific watcher. And sometimes when you read like the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have watchers. I think that's part, those watchers mean or point to uh, the archangels. You had Raguel. So I don't know if he was Italian, made spaghetti sauce, ragu, but uh, translates to friend of God. And he's the archangel of justice and fairness. Uh, the patron of the sacrament of holy orders. You have Zach, uh, Zer Zerachiel, um, these are some other names that he might have shown up in in some writings. He's called God's Command. He's the archangel of God's judgment and the patron of the sacrament of matrimony. Huh. Judgment and matrimony. wonder how that juxtaposes. <laughs> we have uh, Remiel, who is uh, thunder of God or mercy of God or compassion of God. He's the angel of hope and faith. If you want, what I can do is I can take this, uh, what I'll do is I'll get this um, 
this is just a starter link. You can go and zoom around on all the different kinds of things that you'd like. But I think it's kind of interesting to read up on some of these um, archangels because <laughs> they're they're there, you know. Do they all show up in the Bible? No, only two of them Max, show up in the Holy Bible, and that's Gabriel and Michael. So Michael is the archangel. He does the fighting. Um, uh, you know, he shows up in Scripture with battles, and he's the warrior. Uh, he shows up in Revelation 12 uh, with the battle against Satan and his uh, demons. He shows up, I think he wrestles with uh, Satan over the body of Moses and Jude at the end of Jude. Uh, Gabriel shows up uh and now you know with annunciation to mary uh, that she's going to give child well then what's like what's like the context of the other ones if they don't show up why do, like why are they where are they mentioned and what's they're an the deal with them the literature uh they're like an enoch first enoch and some other um apocryphal writings which they're good reading but since they couldn't be validated as absolutely certain they're not included in scripture because yeah, i still don't really understand that but well that's a whole other lesson sure. i guess yeah a brief a brief thing on that is this because i covered this with the seventh and eighth grade religion class john was the last apostle to live all the other ones were persecuted beheaded dead burned on fire crucified upside down whatever the case may be God allowed John to live to be about 100 years old. John, though, his persecution was that he was on the island of Patmos. So they exiled him to Patmos, and that's about 25 miles from the mainland. And it's a six by 10 mile rock with not much on it. So he couldn't escape, and he was on there with the bad guys. But that's where he received his revelation. Now, he received the revelation. But the other thing about John is this. They were able to, and I think this happened after he came back off the island of Patmos, people would bring writings to John. And remember, he lived to about 100 AD or something like that. People could bring John writings, and they were signed by Paul. Um, and he could say, yep, the, these are actual teachings that Jesus taught. Uh, there were a lot of people, though, you got to remember that there were a lot of people uh, because of politics and other things going on in Rome and in the Jewish uh, faith and things like that that wanted to squish and get rid of Christianity. And one of the ways they tried doing it was to circulate false writings or false teachings. And so John was the only one alive who actually sat at the feet of Jesus who could say, yep, this is Jesus teaching. This is, this is verifiably true. Or if some writings came through and said, well, Jesus married Mary Magdalene. Well, he would say, no, that's false. So this whole letter is false. But once he died, there was nobody left to validate or verify any of these things. So that's when the early church said the scripture is closed. Uh, or excuse me, and, and that the canon is closed. So nothing more are we going to add in because we can't verify this? However, there are other things called apocryphal writings, which are good and they sound good, but we can't base our faith on those because we don't know for sure. And so in some of these apocryphal writings, like First and Second Enoch and a, and a number of other ones out there, it's good reading, and that's where some of these other angels show up in. But in the scriptures that are in the canon, um, we only have uh, Gabriel and Michael. Any other questions? Let me put in the chat box the link. And that can be a start for you. And it's got just brief history and, uh, you know, on that, uh, I wouldn't take everything for truth because I didn't read through the whole thing. There's also Catholic websites. Uh, that are on there, and if I can find the other ones, but it's kind of interesting because here you got the archangels, you know, we, you know, and each one's in charge of something separate, so I think that's kind of neat. Okay, so let's take a look at Gabriel because he's the one who's bringing an announcement. He's not just in the New Testament, 
He's from the Old Testament too. So let's take a look. I think we're starting at verse 20 then of chapter 9. While I was, and this is Daniel, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my, um, for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, excuse me, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Uh, know, before, know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, uh, it shall be built again with squares and moat. Uh, but in a troubled time, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and, have, and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall come one uh, who makes desolate until the, de uh, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Okay, there's a lot in there. And I'll try to do the best that I can uh, with, with what we have. Okay, and nobody else checked in. Okay, so I'm going to go to my cheat notes. Whoops, let me get to the cheat notes. Okay, so let's start at 20. Okay, so now Gabriel comes to explain Jerusalem's future. And you know, this is where the 70 weeks come in and different things along that line. And there's a lot of different numbers that are given. But in this section, it goes from 20 to 23. And you can kind of see that in your Bible. It's probably marked off that way. You might have a heading that says, Gabriel brings an answer. And so he comes to Daniel in answer to his prayer. Uh, he touches Daniel and he strengthens him. This, this prayer takes place... Um, at a time, I think it's during like the evening prayer and things along that line, and he's overwhelmed. Uh, he's really tired from fasting and things along that line. So Gabriel comes and he touches him and he strengthens him and he gives him strength to receive this vision that he's about to receive. Um, Gabriel, God also sent Gabriel to give Daniel insight and to give Daniel understanding. So he's coming to give him two things. But it's interesting because it's insight with understanding. And I kind of find that interesting because you can get insight, but what is actually understanding? What is like that? Applying the insight. Okay, maybe applying it how or how it's going to be used or something like that. I've been listening, um, I think in November or December, I got um, um, Proverbs and Psalms for the commuter. And so it's divided up into 31 days. And um, it's really interesting kind of listening to that over and over and over again, especially in Proverbs and some of the places in Psalms where it goes, you know, Proverbs talks a lot about wisdom. 
And the difference between knowledge and wisdom is knowledge is facts and wisdom is how do you use it? Now, also in Proverbs and some of the Psalms, you've got the word wisdom paired with understanding. So there's a difference there. And, you know, I really want to take a look at that, you know, those two words and how they relate with one another, because the way, at least the way I'm envisioning it, and somebody else can chime in if you want, here's facts with knowledge, right? So you got your facts and figures and data and stuff like that. On the other end, you have wisdom. How do you apply it? And then in between, you have understanding. So understanding means you got to figure out how is it being used? Walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. Try to figure that out or try to figure out a situation using the data so that you can apply it. But you got to find out all these other pieces in between. And I think that's maybe how some of the biblical concept of understanding means. Do you get what I'm saying or am I talking in circles? No, that, that makes sense. Because here, Gabriel is sent to give Daniel not just insight, but also insight with understanding. So he's got to figure this, he's, he's got to see the whole purpose of this thing and why this stuff is unfolding the way it is, okay? So um, Gabe is giving, uh, Gabriel is giving Daniel a message um, an insight so uh, to un an understanding and faith in God's plan because he's going to be talking about Jerusalem and you know Jerusalem has to get rebuilt and things like that. So is it the physical Jerusalem uh, that the uh, that the exiles are going to be going back home to? you know is it a different one? Is it both? Is one related to another one? How does this stuff all kind of play out okay? And you might recall that Daniel also received um, these gifts first in Daniel 1, verse 17, and also verse 20. And so in verse 17, this is when he was with Nebuchadnezzar and, and things along that line. It says, as for these four youths, and Daniel was one of them, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Then in verse 20 of chapter 1, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all of his kingdoms. And so that's when Nebuchadnezzar was trying to figure out what is, you know, what was going on and it's these, you know, these, these Judeans and especially Daniel who really could figure this stuff out. So it's a God-given kind of thing. Okay. So pastor, yeah. Um in the, in the in the difference um, when you're talking about the difference between insight and understanding, when Nebuchadnezzar um, actually called them to interpret those dreams, he actually required them to first tell him what the dreams were, and then to interpret them for them. So would the so would the fact that they knew what his dream was be the insight or the knowledge, and then being able to then interpret what that dream what that dream meant? Be the understanding you know i can't remember was it that dream or was it somebody else's dream that they didn't even want to say what it was because they were going to get killed i think it was that first one because they didn't know what the dream was right so they didn't even know but daniel did know because it was revealed to him yeah yeah so not only did he know what the dream was but he was able to understand what the dream meant yes yep 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 that's right that's right yep Okay, um, let's see, in verse 21, some of my notes here, uh, uh, let's see, so I got some Hebrew and Aramaic here. So literally, when, when he talks about in verse 21, it says, while I was speaking in prayer, the, the man Gabriel, uh, whom I had seen in a vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. So in the Hebrew, <coughs> it literally means exhausted in exhaustion. He was touching me. So in this evening sacrifice, you know, I think there was some fasting and different things going on. It was exhausting. And I don't know, you know, in some of your prayer lives and things like that, you know, I don't know if you ever doze off or fall asleep in prayer, but 
he was exhausted. And so um, Gabriel had to come and, um, you know, give him strength. So that word is utterly weary or completely exhausted. And, you know, after working a hard day and things like that, you guys know, you know, you know what that means. You know, it gets pretty tiring sometimes. Okay. Um, let's see if I got any other notes here. And came to tell you great. Okay. Verse 23 that he's greatly loved. So he's great um, at the beginning of your please. For you are greatly loved. So he's very much respected by God. Okay. And uh, uh, I forgot what that word was in Hebrew, but it means what it says there. So that's something to kind of pause and think about too. That not everybody there, you know, Daniel, he was doing what was required. He kept holding the faith. Uh, he kept standing up for, uh, you know, against... And he did it wisely, because if you remember, uh, like in chapter three or something like that, uh, when they were trying to be forced to eat off the king's table, he said, well, let's see if I can go a different way here. And, uh, you know, so Daniel is wise. He's good in his faith. He's standing up against the culture, and he's doing it not like a bull in a china shop. So he's greatly loved. Okay. Then we get into the 70 weeks business. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me get to that part. So this word, uh, let's see, decreed means to be determined, and there's going to be an end point, okay? There's going to be an end to that. That's what that decreed means, about your people and your holy city, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, to anoint a most holy place. This is going to come in on these 70 weeks. These are all what's called infinitives. An infinitive has motion toward something. There's seven of these infinitives, and infinitives kind of work like participle. So it's a verbal noun. Uh, so a swimmer swims, a runner runs, a prophet prophesies, right? And an infinitive in grammar is sort of like that, and it moves, it has action toward something. Does that make sense? So that um, the 70 weeks, when you take a look at in verse 24, there's seven of these infinitives, and infinitives in English oftentimes will begin with the word to, T-O, and it's going to have motion. So if you take a look, um, it says 70 weeks are decreed or determined about your people and your holy city, which is going to mean Jerusalem. And then after the word city, it says to finish the transgressions. Okay, so there's something going to be happening here regarding 70 weeks, and there's going to be a completion of transgressions. Then after that, comma, there's another one. To put an end to sin. Okay, there's some sort of movement or motion toward a completion of sin. And to atone for iniquity. So something's going to be atoned for. It's going to be iniquity. Something's going to happen regarding these 70 weeks. Then you have another set, okay? So you got that first set of three, which has uh, transgression, sin, and iniquity. You got that linking, uh, that linking word, and. So that's your first group of three. Then you got the next group that begins, and it says, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Okay, so the 70 weeks is going to have something to do with bringing in everlasting righteousness. Then after that comma, it's to seal both vision and profit. Huh. Okay. So we got to kind of take a look at that. What does that mean? And Revelation comes in on that one. And to anoint a most holy place. Okay. So we've got these infinitives going on. And then in verse 25, he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, 
there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be a war. Desolations are decreed. Does anybody in verse 28 have some other word other than anointed one in their translation? No? Okay. When you take a look at that in the Hebrew, that word for anointed is Mashiach. We get the word Messiah from that. In the Greek, it's Christus. So when you go Jesus Christ, that's not his last name. Or when you go Christ Jesus, that's not his first name. But that's his title. <clears throat> so Christus is Mashiach. Okay, so it's Mashiach, Jesus, or Jesus, the Mashiach, Messiah. And that plays big here, okay? Because not only is anointed one or the coming of Mashiach, then you have a prince. Does anybody have a different word than prince there? No? In the Hebrew, it's a leader. So you're looking for a leader and you're looking for Messiah. And so it gets combined here. He's going to be a leader and a Messiah. And there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. So now we got to ask, what's the it? That it refers back to Jerusalem. Now, let me get to my notes before I get too far off, <clears throat> okay? Um, in this verse, we also have <clears throat> the word, uh, this phrase, seal up vision and prophet. Do you see that? Or it might say seal both vision and prophet near the end. Do you have that in your translations? Okay. Yeah, that's back up at the end of 24. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, I had everything blocking my view, and I thought maybe my Wi-Fi went out because I wasn't hearing anything. <laughs> Not even crickets. Okay. So this seal up vision and prophet. In the New Testament, this is fulfilled. You know, we see this in Revelation chapter 5 through chapter 8, verse 1. This is this scroll type stuff that's going on. And what happens is the sealing up is kind of um, world history, okay? And in the New Testament, the scroll of world history has the seven seals. And if you remember in chapter five and so on, nobody in heaven and on earth and under the earth was found to be able to open up these seals. Then all of a sudden, the lamb of, you know, this lamb that appears to have been slaughtered comes walking on the scene. And, um, you know, it's, it appears to be crucified. Well, that is showing that imagery is Jesus Christ, who is now resurrected, which, you know, we've celebrated just a few days ago, the resurrection of Jesus. But he also ascended into heaven. So this is like 40 days after Easter the ascension. And so he's now ascended up into heaven, and only he is the one who can open up those seven seals, because he's found, he's the only one found worthy enough to do it. So here in Daniel, you have this seal up the vision and the prophet. So it's sealing this stuff up, and in Revelation we find out it's full, it can only be opened up by this Mashiach leader. Am I making any sense? 
Because to better understand Revelation, it's good that we're going through Daniel and parts of Isaiah and Ezekiel. Because all these guys kind of go together, but everything's, you know, fulfilled in Christ and things along that line. So um, the seal up vision and prophet, it's going to be pointing toward, you know, Jesus. We see this in the Revelation of John in chapter in Revelation 5 through chapter 8, verse 1. Now we've got this Jerusalem's history as 70 weeks. And I'm just going to read what was written here because I'll tell you, he's got about 20 pages on this stuff and it can get really dicey. So um, I'm going to do the best that I can, okay? He says here, like for verse 24, and this is verses 24 through 27, you got Jerusalem's history as weeks. Um, if you remember last time we met two weeks ago speaking of weeks uh, if you remember that jeremiah uh, daniel's prayer also ties in with jeremiah's prophecy because jeremiah and daniel were contemporaries jeremiah prophesied that this exile is going to last 70 years and it lasted you rounded up you know a year it lasted 70 years and so um how does this work with Jeremiah's 70 years? Is it the literal 70 years where the exiles then are going to be going back to Jerusalem? And is that when thing, is that when the clock starts ticking for these 70 weeks and making it into that? This is what a lot of people ask. So I'll just read this. Many commentators believe that Gabriel was interpreting Jeremiah's 70 years and that Daniel's prayer was about the meaning of the 70 years. However, Gabriel is not interpreting the meaning of Jeremiah's prophecies of the duration of Jerusalem's desolation by Babylon. So remember that they were in exile for 70 years, and during that 70 years, the temple was desecrated and everything was torn down in Jerusalem. That was, one of, that was the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. But Daniel's prayer isn't speaking to that, okay? Daniel clearly understood Jeremiah's prophecies and stated uh, in uh, verse 2 of chapter 9, and stated that in verse 2 of chapter 9. So if you take a look at verse 2 of chapter 9, what does it say? It says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord and Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So we don't want to get these two mixed up, the literal 70 years and this figurative number of 70 weeks. Are you still tracking with me? Okay. So instead, God, through Gabriel, uses the number 70 as a motif to explain a future desolation. Which kind of makes sense because if you're thinking about, hey, I'm in exile here, and it's been 70 years that we've been in Babylon, that number 70 is sticking out in your brain, right? Because you know, your whole family's been there for 70 years. Grandpa, he's getting ready to die. You know, he's been there since the beginning, 70 years. You know, everybody's got the 70 years on the front burner of their mind. 70 years. But now you're hearing 70 weeks. 70 means desolation or exile or something like that. It means something not really good. So this motif of 70 helps explain a future desolation that will occur during the 70 weeks instead of the desolation lasting 70 years. God's intent is not to interpret Jeremiah, but rather to answer the concerns of Daniel's prayer. And what is his prayer? His prayer here is forgiveness needed for himself, and forgiveness needed for the sins of the people. It's also a turning of God's wrath from Jerusalem 
and the rebuilding of the city, which will be destroyed along with its holy place. This destruction will be prompted by the cutting off of the Messiah, who will nevertheless confirm a covenant or a promise for the many and cause the Old Testament sacrifices to cease. Let's stop there because this all gets fulfilled in Jesus Christ, okay? Obviously from 538 BC to Jesus crucifixion is way longer than 490 years. If you want, if people try to calculate it that way, um, you know, 70 years, all these kinds of things. But we see how this is fulfilled when you take a look at this because there is a future desolation that happens. Let's just kind of start with Jesus, okay? Remember Jesus says in the Gospels, I think it's the Gospel of John, like toward the beginning of the Gospel of John, he says, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Do you remember that? And the Pharisees and the leaders are looking around laughing at Jesus as they're standing here by this huge temple. And it says it took us 80 some years, you know, to build this thing. And you're going to rebuild it in three days? Well, what, what was Jesus talking about? He was talking about his body. His body. So that's the temple of God. The temple is where God makes his dwelling among his people. And so in Jesus Christ, God is fully dwelling. He's not speaking about the temple building, but he's speaking about himself. And this prophecy in Daniel points to Jesus because the temple will be destroyed. Okay? Now let's take a look at that then. Um, it's going to be destroyed, but then it's going to be built up again. So when you take a look at verse 24, in, in those infinitives, where it says decreed about your people, so your people, that means Daniel, Daniel, your people, and your holy city, it's to finish the transgression. Well, on the cross of Calvary, we celebrated Good Friday about a week ago. Isn't that the completion or the finish of transgression? Yeah. And then the next infinitive, to put an end to sin. Doesn't sin end on the cross in Jesus Christ, which is the temple that was destroyed? And then the next infinitive, to atone for iniquity, okay? Atone means to pay for, and it's all covered up. That word kafar in Hebrew is atone, or to cover, all our, to cover everything. Well, isn't all iniquity covered by the blood of Christ? And don't you receive that benefit in your baptisms? You know, your sin is washed away. It's covered. It's kafard. It's uh, you know, atoned for. And you have that whole atoning thing with the Day of Atonement. And in the Old Testament, you had this sacrifice, this Day of Atonement, where, if I remember right, there were two goats. And one of the goats was where, um, where uh, the priest would lay his hands on the first goat, and then that goat would be sacrificed, and then you'd see the blood running all over the place. And then the people would go, ah, that should be my blood. Okay, but this is my substitute. And then the other goat, the priest would take his hands and place the sin, his sins and the sins of the people on that goat and then shush them into the wilderness never to be seen again. Uh, signifying that our sins are taken away as far as the east is from the west. And so that's what the word atonement is. But in Christ, all, you know, both of these things are brought together. So it's not only paid for, but it's also taken away. Okay, 
So that's done at the, at the cross. And that's that infinitive too, to atone for iniquity. Okay. And then we have the next infinitive to bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, in Christ, isn't there everlasting righteousness that's given to the people? There certainly is. And then it's to seal both vision and prophet and to anoint a most holy place. Now, when we're talking about Jerusalem here, this 70 stuff comes in pretty big. Uh, Gabriel is not interpreting the meaning of Jerusalem, uh, of Jeremiah's prophecies of the duration of Jerusalem's desolation by Babylon. So he's not referring to that, uh, to their exile and all the stuff that's happening. But he clearly understood the prophecies. Uh, and God, through Gabriel, uses his number 70, as I mentioned, to explain a future desolation that will occur during the 70 weeks. instead of lasting 70 years. God's intent is not to interpret this, but to answer the concerns as I mentioned. Now, this 70 weeks is also kind of interesting because <clears throat> weeks is really important. And when you use the word week, it's symbolic of a period of time. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 21 and 22, God declares that you can tell a false prophecy from a real prophecy. And how do you do that? Well, if the prophecy comes true, then it was true. And that prophet is true. But if it doesn't come true, then that prophet is false. Don't listen to him, stone him, and all that kind of stuff. Well, even after Antiochus, who treated the Jews harshly, the Jews continued to preserve the book of Daniel with this 70 weeks in it. So they, they are <clears throat> saying that, yeah, this prophet Daniel is true. So these weeks, this term weeks is used um, as imagery, not literally. The Christians also understood it that way, that these, that these 70 weeks are not a literal interpretation, but it's symbolic for something, and it points to Christ and is fulfilled in Christ. So both Jews and Christians continue to hold Daniel, the whole book of Daniel, as complete and prophetic. They wouldn't have done that if the 70 weeks would have meant something else. Are you tracking with me on that? Are you tracking with me? So we're going to the first part of faith traditions. Faith traditions held this true. So that means that they also believed and understood that the 70 weeks was symbolic, meaning something else. Now, the other thing is, you take a look at this um, weeks business and the word week is drawn from Genesis 1. What happened in Genesis 1? God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, right. he did creation, right? He created everything out of nothing in six 24-hour days, and then he created the Sabbath day of rest. So this week... This word week or weeks is bringing the, uh, the hearers back to Genesis 1. Because remember, we, you know, I've said this many times, I think on here, but I know on Sunday morning Bible class and things like that, modern day Western Christians, we got to start, you know, we, we got to kind of start thinking Jewishly. We have to kind of start thinking messianically. And what do I mean by that? Well, when they hear weeks, they automatically go to, you know, uh, not automatically every single time, but when they hear these things, you know, they understand, oh, this one God, Yahweh, created everything out of nothing in a week. And so this 70 week or 70 weeks 
is referring to some sort of a creation or recreation or a restoration of creation. Are you tracking with me? Okay. Well, you know, we're in Easter and just a few days ago, we celebrated it very early in the morning at 6 a.m. for those of you who made it to a sunrise service. And, uh, um, you know, and I was there. Uh, you know, it's, you know, this is when Christ rose from the tomb. And this is when Jesus now ushered in this new age of salvation. Pentecost is going to fill out more of that. But Jesus ushered in this new age of recreation or restoration. Because in this age, this new creation, God is just restoring what he originally did in Genesis 1 and 2. But we got this little thing called sin and death and damnation that kind of interrupted his plan. But in God's time frame, it goes like this. So in Christ, everything is restored back. And so the 70 weeks is kind of showing 70 is something's going to be restored and atoned for and righteousness and, and, and all of this other stuff it, with these infinitives. And it's going to be 70 and weeks. So it's all pointing towards Calvary and Easter in Christ. There's going to be a new restoration. Are you still tracking with me? Now, when it talks about Jerusalem, obviously, you know, we do have to take a look at the physical geographic Jerusalem. But the Bible also speaks of the new Jerusalem in Revelation and, and elsewhere. It also means that New Jerusalem doesn't get destroyed. It comes down from heaven. The New Jerusalem also means or equals the Christian church. So whenever you hear about the New Jerusalem or Jerusalem, things like that, think Christian church and then think yourself because you are one of the living stones or the living bricks, as Peter puts it, of this Christian church here on earth. You are a part of the body of Christ that was desolated and destroyed on the cross, but was raised again to new life and restored on Easter. Are you still tracking with me? So, you know, the 70 weeks isn't all that mysterious. Um, now, what do we do with the, you know, the, the literal Jerusalem? Well, in, um, um, let me look at my notes now because I got off of them. There was a time when Jerusalem was destroyed, and now I got to find it. Jerusalem was destroyed. Here it is. Okay. So, um, Jerusalem was destroyed. And the temple will be destroyed at the time of the coming of the leader. Okay, so in these verses here, I think it's in verse uh, like 26, it says, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one, or in the Hebrew, Mashiach, a Mashiach, Messiah, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. This is the crucifixion. Remember, Mashiach, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus on the cross literally had nothing and no one. So he's fulfilling this. And it says then, uh, continuing on in 26, and the people of the prince or leader, which Jesus is, combining it, who is to come, meaning Jesus, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end, there shall be a war. Desolations are decreed. Now, what's this about? Does it mean that this Mashiach, this Messiah slash also leader, is going to destroy Jerusalem? Or is Jerusalem going to be destroyed because of this Messiah 
and leader. And both can be valid. When you take a look at, at the, uh, one, uh, the history of Jerusalem, um, the war, the Jewish war began, I think, in 60 AD. And it went on for four years to 70 AD. 70 AD is one of those big dates in church history because that's when Jerusalem fell and the temple fell again. That's when the Romans came in and just wiped out everything. Okay? Leveled leveled Jerusalem, you know, and just, and when you read Josephus and um, Josephus and who's the other church historian, the early one? Well, Josephus, he's a Jewish historian, and he writes about this in his section called Wars, and you can read about this, and it's just a slaughter, literally just blood all over the place, people dead when they came in. Also, Eusebius, one of the early church fathers, and I've got that book here. This is the best preserved um, work on early church history that's around because he wrote this in 324 AD, and he covers a lot of stuff and includes a lot of things that were lost. So 70 AD, Jerusalem was trampled, and... Um, you could say that it was because of the Jewish people, the ethnic kin of Messiah. So Messiah did do it, if you want to look at it that way. Okay. Now, you also could say that um, this destruction of Jerusalem and the temple can be ascribed to the leader himself, meaning Jesus. And that kind of goes, you can use Mark 14, verse 58 to that. Because at his uh, kangaroo court, his kangaroo trial, the people were saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And in three days, I will build another not made with hands. So in a <clears throat> sort of a roundabout grammatical way, it can go either way. But either way, Jesus fulfills it either by it being destroyed because of the Jews which were his kin and the Romans came in and wiped them out, or because Jesus was talking about uh, the temple and it just got people mad and, and etc. Am I making any sense to you guys? Okay. So this destruction and the 70 weeks really isn't that much of a mystery. Also in 135 AD, there was uh, some more destruction going on, okay, uh, with, with the Jews. So really this refers to um, Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's also the leader. You know, in, in Daniel, it's, it's, it could be interpreted as maybe two different people, but when you look forward, you see that it's both, um, both fulfilled in one person, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, as also the leader of his people. And also the 70 points forward to a destruction. Uh, you see the physical destruction of the physical city, Jerusalem, in 70 AD, and then some stuff in 135 AD. But also you see the weeks as the creation, but in Christ, you have the new creation of the new Jerusalem. So the 70 weeks is kind of look is is fulfilled in Christ on Calvary, Easter, and the building of the new Jerusalem through baptism. How's that? That makes sense. Any questions or comments? I see all microphones, all microphones, except mine. Okay, well, I'd like to leave it at that because then, you know, we'll take a look at, um, we'll start 10 next week, but I don't want to really get into the weeds because A, I'm going to lose myself, 
by trying to get into all the different things that people say about um, the meaning of the 70 and the weeks and time periods and all this weird kind of stuff. Um, I just kind of wanted to give you the basics of how it's understood for the strengthening of our faith and how this is fulfilled in Christ and Easter. Okay. So if we get, so without going into the weeds and getting all um, um, picky about how many days, how many years each week um, symbolizes, and we just, um, we, we, we take the thought that you said the messianic or the um, the Jewish thought of seven meaning um, completeness, if you will, I guess. Yep. Um, so when so when Gabriel first tells him, he first gives him the seventy weeks in verse twenty four, um, and he talks about the seventy weeks to restore the holy city and to fulfill all the righteousness and anoint the most holy place and so forth. Does he then um, start then in 25, he breaks down those 70 weeks. And because I noticed that, that, that they add up, you've got, you've got seven weeks, six, seven weeks to rebuild the city to completeness, then 62 um, uh, until maybe 62 to build. And then the seven weeks and then, and another week mm -hmm. so that's the 70 right that's yep. yeah yep. so he breaks down that complete 70 weeks mm -hmm. into and and what and what i'll do here maybe i can take a picture of this or whatever uh, let's see if i can show this can you see um <laughs> do, you have do you have the commentary of daniel yeah, I'm trying to, uh, I tried to make you full screen just. Oh, okay. So it's... this comes out of Daniel. It's a Lutheran scholar. I like Steinman. He's really good. Okay. And he shows this. The timeline. The timeline. And you see the traditional view there? Can you read that? It's tiny. Pretty small. Oh, it's yeah. in the study bible too pastor yeah it's in the lutheran study bible you've got okay that? we do have that? that we have that uh, yeah it's on page uh 1417 on the in the lutheran study bible 1000 1417 under daniel 9 14 yeah 17. yeah and daniel 9 that makes sense <laughs> duh Okay. I can't use the pages because I have the uh, Lutheran Study Bible electronic, and when I oh. make, and oh, okay. when I make the when I make the font big enough for me to read without my glasses, there's over ten thousand pages. In yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, and maybe not everybody online has the Study Bible, but let me just take a look. Maybe that's where he got that from because I was using my regular Bible. Oh yeah, there it is. So that's what he's got included there. You can take a look at that. Um, and that's how he interprets it. So um, the seven weeks you've got there from Cyrus, he gives the edict of uh, the edict of Cyrus is um, you guys can now all, you know, all exiles can go back home. So the, you know, the Jews can go back home, the Egyptians, you know, anybody can go back home now. So you've got it there. And then that seven weeks is, you know, going back to Jerusalem. And then you got Nehemiah, right? And so you got the rebuilding of the wall with Nehemiah. And then you got the 62 weeks. So it's not a literal 62 weeks. But within that, it goes from the building of, um, you know, the, the walls and from Nehemiah to the birth of Jesus. And so that's the 62 weeks. And in there, you've got Antiochus, who desecrates the temple in 167 BC. So he desecrates the temple, and that is uh, part of Daniel's prophecy, where there will be desolation and desecration, etc. Then with Jesus, now you've got the next week, and that goes from Jesus' birth to 135 A.D., when, the, uh, when Hadrian conquers Jerusalem. And in between there, you've got the life of Jesus, 
the crucifixion of Jesus, which, you know, fulfills all those, you know, infinitives that I told you about before uh, in that verse. So you've got that and you got the Easter stuff going on. Then in 70 AD, you know, Titus destroys the temple physically and literally. Um, and then, you know, the half a week is when Hadrian, you know, conquers Jerusalem. So that's a traditional view. That's the view of Luther and Calvin. Uh, you got some other conservative uh, Lutheran scholars that take a look at the uh, typological uh, one down on the bottom. I didn't really work through the Messianic one. Uh, I mean, I didn't really work through the typological one. I would imagine it's 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 good as well. But I like the, uh, at this point, at least, from what I read and studied, I like the traditional view. But I know the other view uh, works as well. They're very close, minor differences. Yeah. Thanks, Roxanne and whoever else pointed that out in the study Bible. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, if not, then we will start. Let me look at my other non-study Bible. Because I've got the Bible that studies itself in Lutheran. <laughs> the Lutheran study Bible. So then next week, let's see. We've got the terrify, terrifying vision of a man. Then the week after that, we have the kings of the north and the south. And then we complete stuff, uh, chapter 12. So we got about three weeks. What, what will that put us in? In May? Something like that. And then after that, um, in May, we'll do something for a couple of weeks. And in June, the church is starting small groups on, uh, small group studies on, um, Gospel DNA. What does it mean? And this was written by um, a Lutheran pastor who's a district president now of Texas. And so it's more um, a practical sort of a study, and we'll be going through that. If you wanted to pick up the book and read it, it's called Gospel DNA. And I can find that and stick it in the chat box. Let me do that for you. And I like it because it's laid out in a few different sections. It brings in practical things of, you know, well, how do we live? What are we supposed to do as Christians? You know, how, how do we live out this resurrection life among other people? Things like that. So let me uh, get this for you. Gospel DNA. Okay, let me copy. And paste. So if you want to pull that out, um, you know, it's it's in there. Okay. Did everybody get that? And we'll be doing about, I think, 10 studies on that during summertime because it's kind of, you know, some people go on vacation, some don't, you know, we go at different times and things like that. So this will be a little easier to figure out. And if you're on vacation, I think we're having another online version of it. So I'll have it for my Thursday night and I think we're doing another online version of it. So if you can't make it on that Thursday, you know, we'll have another opportunity online. Okie doke. Okay. Well, with that, then, why don't we uh, uh, close with a prayer? Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this Easter. And it's not just a day. It's an event that changed the course of history and humanity's destination from eternity in hell and damnation to eternity in the restored creation, the, the new paradise that Jesus has created. Thank you, Lord, for instilling in us that resurrection DNA in our baptisms, giving us new life and uh, uh, faith to follow Jesus through thick and thin. You are always there with us. Thank you for your prophet Daniel, 
uh, and the 70 weeks, which points to the cross, the empty Easter tomb, the new creation, and the Christian church, of which you have made us a part of in baptism. So be with us, walk with us, sustain us again throughout this week uh, in the holy waters that we are new creatures, new every day because of Jesus, and uh, send your angels to guard and protect us this week. In Jesus' name, the resurrected Lord, we pray. Amen. Okie dokie. Does everybody have off that information out of the chat box before I sign off? Because I think it goes bye-bye after that. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah.